G'day, Troy Dean from WP Elevation, and welcome to episode 39 of the WP Elevation podcast. I hosted this podcast from my hometown of South Australia while I was there visiting and running some online marketing workshops for some clients. And uh, while I was in town, uh, one of our customers, uh, David, very kindly offered to lend me his office so I could go and record a podcast episode with our feature guest, who this week is Simon Dixon from Code for the People. He was in the UK, and uh, I've been travelling recently, and this is the third time we've tried to do this this, uh, episode. So come hell or high water, I was going to do it while I was in Adelaide, and that meant going down to David's office, which he kindly hung around late into the evening so that I could record the episode. Uh, Simon Dixon, Code for the People, some of their clients include the Rolling Stones and Stephen Fry. I don't know how you land big fish like that, but we're going to find out in this episode. And also, Simon talks a lot about how Choosing WordPress as a platform and specializing in just that one piece of technology and not doing anything else, like not doing Magento or Joomla or any other uh, Drupal or any other sites, any other platforms, how that actually isn't a restriction, but it's, it's actually liberating and it allows you to be more creative. Uh, some great insights in this interview from Simon. He really is at the top of his game. Code for the People are one of only two European agencies who are WordPress VIP partners. Of course, the other one being Human Made, uh, Noel Tock and Tom Wilmot, who have previously been on the podcast. And it's interesting to hear Simon talk about how he views his competition, uh, Human Made. Um, stick around for, for his take on that. Uh, the, the Speaking of competitions, the competition this week, I'm giving away a free coaching call with myself on Skype for uh, about 45 minutes. I'm happy to jump online and you can ask me anything about running a WordPress consulting business. So stick around for details on how to enter that competition. This is a great interview. I learned a lot. I hope you, did. I hope you do too. Stay with us. Let's elevate. This is the WP Elevation Podcast, helping WordPress consultants elevate. This episode of the WP Elevation podcast is brought to you by Video User Manuals, the first, the original, and the best video tutorial plugin that puts over 60 video tutorials in your client's dashboard to teach them how to use WordPress and how to use WooCommerce and how to use SEO by Yoast. Uh, You can learn more about the Video User Manuals plugin and see how it can help you attract new clients, win more business, use it as part of your pre-sales process, and use it to differentiate yourself and stand out from the pack, uh, and also see a video walkthrough of how the plugin works. Uh, You can get all of this at wpelevation.com slash vum. Uh, Very simple, wpelevation.com slash vum. Go check it out. All right, the elevation tip this week is specialize. Great quote. I read recently from Seth Godin, he says, bring me a brilliant specialist every time. So if you feel like you are a general kind of WordPress developer or a general WordPress consultant, uh, my advice to you would be start specializing in a particular area. Ask yourself what you're passionate about the most, what it is you love doing, what you're best at, and then specialize in doing that until eventually uh, your whole business is just built around specializing in a particular area. Uh, I know when when I started to focus on WordPress consultants and started to you know narrow n- narrow my focus down in just helping WordPress consultants build their business it made every other decision in our business easy and our business has absolutely exploded since we decided to do that rather than just being a generalist uh, online marketing coach we now just specialize in business coaching for WordPress consultants and it made a huge difference and it actually just makes your business easier to run because there's less confusion and much more focus. All right, uh, the reason this is the tip of the week this week is because Simon Dixon talks a lot about why specializing in WordPress is a good thing. Some of his clients, as I mentioned, include the Rolling Stones and Stephen Fry and uh, we spoke a lot about how to land big fish like that. He's got some great ideas and some great insights. Uh, He is from Code for the People. His name is Simon Dixon. Let's go and meet him right now. G'day, Troy Dean here from WP Elevation, and I'm very pleased to have with me all the way from the UK, Simon Dixon from Code for the People. Hey, Simon, how are you? I'm doing very well. How are you, sir? Excellent. I'm very well, thank you. And thank you for all of your patience in us finally hooking up and doing this interview. This is like, I think this is the third time we've tried to do this. And I keep it's, disappearing out of the country in a different time zone. So uh, 
This is the perils of operating across a globe, mate. This is how it works. Exactly. And as you may notice, for those of you who are familiar podcast watchers, I'm not in my usual studio. I'm actually here in my hometown of South Australia presenting a couple of workshops uh, to some people about online strategy. And I am in one of my customers' offices down here in South Australia. I'm actually sitting on the reception desk right now filming this uh, podcast interview. So it's all new and it's all fun. Uh, we're going to talk all about WordPress stuff and freelancing and building an agency. But before we do that, quick competition announcement. I've gone a little bit crazy and I'm going to give away a free coaching call on Skype with myself. So stick around for details on how you can enter the draw to win that later on in the interview. All right, Simon Dixon, before we start talking about the Rolling Stones and Stephen Fry, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Do you know, I was dreading this question. I really was because... <laughs> You know, I, there were so many little phases I went through as a kid. The only common thread I could really find in it was I was up for innovation. Um, I grew up through the 70s and 80s, and various points I got really obsessed by the space program. You know, every school exercise book I had had a picture of a space shuttle on it. Uh, I, I was attracted into home computing very early. I was really into the kind of explosion of, of television and media. Um, politics as well um there's there's probably a part of this that comes from where i grew up i was born and raised in belfast and i, I grew up there through the 70s and 80s and for those of the that know your your international politics that wasn't a great place to be at that particular time i've got to stress i wasn't in a bad bit of time so i never saw much actual trouble myself but my childhood was punctuated by bombs and army patrols in the streets and you know security guards on every major store front door and and I kind of I, th I think as growing up I, I just wanted to get away from that I was ready for something different I needed to, to change my world or, or the world I was in so I, I, I just knew whatever I wanted to do it wasn't this it wasn't where I was and it it kind of became it wasn't anything that was there so I got to, I got to university actually, and really still hadn't pinned anything down. Um, I did a business degree because it seemed to make sense. You know, I, I, it would come in handy at some point, <laughs> and it took the best part of twenty years, but we've kind of got there. Um, and yeah, I, I just kind of started watching for something that I could really get my teeth into. And, and I even, you know, at the age of 20, 21, I was really struggling for what was it going to be? So when did, when did you discover the internet? When, when, did you, when did you first discover the internet? And was it, did you instantly think, okay, this is now I can apply my business degree to this? Or was it something that you discovered recreationally and the business side of it came later? Well, I, I was at university in 1990 to 94, which was really kind of the mm. very, very early pioneering days. Mm. And... I was lucky with the university I went to. I think we were the first in the UK to have a, a campus-wide IT network. So we had access to things like uh, external email, which was you know, ro literally rocket oh, science. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> or Gopher. I mean, I don't even know if, uh -huh. if you remember Gopher. I do. Kind yeah. of, it was like sort of text-only web browsing, um, Telnet, things like this. And it just blew my mind. You know, I remember sitting one evening in a computer lab because I had nothing else to do that night and using a computer at Yale or Harvard or somewhere and I just couldn't process it. Yeah. And yeah, I think, I think in this I suddenly realized this is a big deal. This is really going to be significant. Mm. And for everything I did in university through that, I mean, I warmed the computer stuff. I was always good at that stuff. Um, I kind of approached the end of my studies. Uh, it was 94 when I finished. I think the first website I ever saw was the, the 94 World Cup website. <laughs> and I remember the joy of being able to download a picture. A picture. This, you know, I mean, I, I've got two young kids and trying to explain to them yeah. how the world used to be. Yeah. You know, there was a great thing to the runs on Twitter the other day of, um, how Google would have been 20 years ago and it was, you know, right in your search query, post it and wait 28 days for delivery. <laughs> this is normal. This was normal. Yeah. And, and the kids, you know, the kids expect to just get that episode of that show on TV in HD now. Yeah. And every now and again, I just got to kind of grab them and say, you've got to appreciate how yeah. different this is. <laughs> totally. 
It's funny, I had, this, I had the same conversation today presenting this workshop talking about pre-internet and, and post-internet. The first website I uh, uh, accessed was the Melrose Place episode guide because I wanted to see what, what was happening in Melrose Place in the States before we got a broadcast mm-hmm. in Australia so that I could go to all my friends and be a spoiler and, and tell them what was going to happen in future episodes. <laughs> but then I, I remember the internet happening, but I actually don't, I don't describe the world is pre-internet, post-internet, I describe it as pre-Google, post-Google, because as much as the internet changed things, Google then completely changed everything again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can can remember Alta Vista. Alta Vista really shit. This is going to turn into a terrible history lesson. I'm really sorry. (laughs) That's I'm totally here. Like Alta Vista? (laughs) No, I mean, I remember Yahoo being the be-all and end-all. I remember when it was when it was a Stanford dot edu address even, um, and then Alta Vista came along and tried to do free text search indexing, and did, didn't do a bad job. And for two or three years, that was that was the pinnacle. Yep. And then Google came along, and I really remember thinking, this Google had better be good. Yeah. Because Alta Vista is pretty great. Yeah. And it took maybe a couple of months for me to to warm to it, but yeah, I think. If I've developed one skill in life, it's been being able to sort of see what's coming down the track next. And people I knew were talking about Google in a in a really positive way. People I trusted, people I respected. And if they got it, then I was going to put time into it to get it. Yeah. And yeah, and I mean that's that's kind of what put me into WordPress. It was very much the same story that people I knew and respected were talking about it. I'd been playing with TypePad and Blogger. Um, WordPress was was evolving over here, and there were one or two people starting to. I remember Robert Scoble, who was the, the mm. Microsoft guy at the time, got a, an early WordPress install done for him, I think. And and okay, this is interesting. Now this thing's beginning to get traction. And yeah, I, I think I've just developed that confidence to to trust my instincts and make the leap. Mm. And. Yeah, I didn't get this one wrong. Yeah. Do you, do you remember the first time you saw the WordPress dashboard? It was the day that WordPress.com opened to the public. Right. Which would have been November 95-ish. Probably got that wrong. 2000, but yeah, I, I, I 2005? knew 2005? I think so, yeah. Yeah, 2005, yeah. Uh, and and I, I... Yeah, p- p- people, people were, were using it and I couldn't wait to get my hands on it. But the... The chore of, of getting another hosting account and getting you know, PHP and MySQL installed, which you know wasn't easy at the time, still sometimes isn't. Um, yeah, when somebody offered me a, a hosted service that I could just kind of get into and poke around, that was that was good enough for me. But even then, it took me two or three months to sort of to see it and to get it. Mm. Um, I can remember. I, in fact, what what warned me to, to WordPress generally was actually somebody using. It was movable type. Mm. The first guy I met who was running an ordinary website using nominally a blogging platform, that really opened my eyes. But I knew all sorts of good reasons not to use movable type. Mm. So I'm thinking, well, hang on, maybe maybe this WordPress thing over here can do something similar. So at this point, are you consulting with clients and building websites for clients using static HTML or some other some other system? Or was WordPress the first time you started doing client services? Well, I did the best part of 15 years doing um, full-time employment or long-term contract web work for large clients. Right. Um, I worked, uh, worked in a diplomatic service for five years initially. I, I worked for uh, Sky News for two and a half. Mm-hmm. I, I sort of jumped in and out of government at various periods. Mm-hmm. Um, and I finally sort of made the leap uh, about 2007, I think, um, Family responsibilities were growing for me, um, and I just got really bored of corporate web development. Mm. It was killing me. You know, I was so lucky to try. I got into the web in the very, very earliest days, and I, in a great environment as well. I, I was, I was the UK government's first full-time web guy. Wow! And I, I was in in the Foreign Office, which is our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, yep. State Department, and. Um, they knew there was something in this for them, but they didn't really have a clue of what. And they just found a guy who knew a bit about it, and that was me. And they said, there you go, there's all the kit you need. Um, off you go, see what you can do. I, I mean, culturally, it was easy for them because that's what diplomats do. They go off to foreign countries, and they're not seen for 
maybe three years at a time. <laughs> trusted. If you've passed the, the, the kind of entrance exam, you're trusted. And they let you kind of make your own decisions a large part of the time. Um, and that's what they did with me on the web. I, I had three or four years just doing what I wanted. Wow. And being trusted to make the right calls. And it was great. Um, and, I, you know, I remember meeting up, at, you know, after work occasionally with people in similar positions elsewhere in government. And we talked about, you know, wouldn't it be great when people respect what we do and understand and really get a grip on it? And I hate to say it, it was the worst thing that could have happened because suddenly the bureaucracy increased, the management increased, the meetings increased, the paperwork increased. And I, I got to I, I was 2005, 6, 7, and I just longed to be back in those days when I could mm. do something. Yeah, 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 and I, yeah, yeah. Reached the end of my table internally. Yeah. Do you? It's interesting. I want to talk about just just a little sidebar at the moment. You the scale. I mean, you guys are a big agency now. You're a WordPress VIP partner. Some of your clients include Rolling Stones and Stephen Fry, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But do you do you kind of miss those days of just being able to take a, a little client and knock something up for them in a couple of days and get creative and where, where, where the kind of iteration and the time to the time from idea to market was really quick. Do you know? I'll tell you what I miss. I miss owning a project, right? Start to finish, yeah, you yeah. know, and being able to love it for two, three, four years. You know, I, I, I would really like to get deep, 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 deep into a project and, you know, improve it incrementally and, and really have a long vision for it. And you can do that to an extent with client work but you're never in control, mm. you know, and there are times I just think, I wish, I wish I could take your job and, and, and run this site because I, I, I can see where I want it to get to. And we'll do all we can from outside to kind of nudge you along that trail. But yeah, every now and again, you know, I, I think you see it occasionally where people, people take something off you and then you can sort of sense it going downhill a little and you think, Oh, I just wish that was my <laughs> site. You know? Do you still have a sandbox where you get to play with your own little kind of hobby ideas or your own little projects that have nothing to do with Code for the People? Um, uh, I've had to wean myself off that. Right. <laughs> I think, you know, as part of the scaling up process, um, I've, I've had to recognise that my, my shelf life is, is severely limited now in terms of actually frontline mm. work. And I've kind of stepped back now completely from actually doing the frontline stuff because... Uh, there was there was a nice kind of break point I think about a year ago if you want, pardon my choice of words when <laughs> sponsor came in and less and sass and all these things and I kind of thought now you know I'm in my 40s now do I want to sit down and learn all this stuff yeah yep or do I just trust it to the people who know it instinctively better than I do and yep. it just that was my moment yeah it's interesting I had exactly the same experience and in fact we have a um, we have a rule in our company now where I'm not allowed to touch any code. <laughs> Yeah, well. <laughs> which you know, which is really frustrating. Although my business yeah. partner has very kindly set up a sandbox for me, where I'm allowed to go and do whatever I want and break whatever I want, and it's got nothing to do with our client, our client work. But client services and our own products, I'm not allowed to touch any code. I, I, I still, I, I've still got my logins to the kind of Git repositories and that. And if something needs doing, then I'm happy to wade in. Yeah. You know, I really respect these business leaders who, who you know, go and do their time on the front line. So I like to feel that if if it needed to happen, it could happen. Yeah. But it's not in anyone's interest for that to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mine or the clients or the rest of the team. <laughs> so how do you describe what you do in one sentence? When you meet someone for the first time and they say, hey, Simon, what do you do? What's your elevator pitch, so to speak? What do I do or what do we do? Um, well, if you just meet someone at a social function and they say, hey, Simon, what do you do? What's your, what's well, your I, run, I run a company. No, that, that's, that's, that's what I do. Right. And I, I run a company which puts the benefits of blogging software into large corporates. Right. And that's, you know, I mean, there's, there's always a kind of a tension, I think, between how much you talk up the technology and maybe how much you talk up the WordPress brand itself. Yeah. It's always been something I've been very comfortable with because the kind of people that we want to be dealing with are people who are in a large corporate who probably know a fair bit about the technology, not enough to do it themselves, yeah. but they understand the technical detail. They know a lot of the kind of product names and that. So I, I'm very comfortable. And, and, and even as soon as we started sort of specialising in WordPress, that, that wasn't a complicated decision for me. We were a WordPress shop. Yep. And I know there's a tension. You hear people 
Uh, I mean, I've, I've heard you mentioned Jake Goldman earlier on when we were speaking. I, I th- Jake, I know, has a certain hostility to be known as a WordPress team mm. um, at Ten Up. I'm very happy with it because I think it helps us bring people to our door mm. who who know what we're about, who just get us immediately. We don't have to persuade them. Mm. Um, but in, in, in just the, the, in terms of this sense of the benefits of blogging software, you know. Again, people have always tried to persuade me that WordPress needs to leave behind its blogging roots, and I don't buy that. I think WordPress is what it is because of its blogging roots, Mm. and I don't think we should be shy about that. Mm. You know, fundamentally, WordPress is a platform that you as an individual can use without too much technical knowledge, Mm. and and I think that's a good thing. That's what a blog was conceived to be. And, you know, I've been the guy on the inside in a large corporate, and my job has been to run that website. And I don't want to have to go to an IT department who probably don't like me. <laughs> you know, we've all been there. Yeah. The joy of having a site I can control myself, um, you know, you can't beat that. You yeah. just cannot beat that. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's, that's what I wish someone had brought to me when I was on the inside on these big organizations. So, yeah, that's, that's what we're here to present. I think it's an interesting. I think it's an interesting distinction you make too, because I, you know, my my audience are predominantly freelancers who are targeting small business owners. So we actually say a lot of the time, don't talk about the technology because you end up turning yourself into a commodity. But in your space, it's a it's a completely different thing. And we've, we're starting now in our client services agency to work with some larger clients who are approaching us because we are WordPress specialists, because they have a content strategy team, they have a content marketing team, they are constantly publishing information, and they know that WordPress is the best solution for them. So they're asking for WordPress. So I think it's. I mean, why wouldn't you piggyback on that that great brand reputation? Yep. You know, you, you don't have to look at too many studies on the internet to find that WordPress comes out top in terms of flexibility, mm-hmm. low cost, usability. Why wouldn't you want to jump on the back of that horse? I just yeah. don't understand that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but there were people. I mean, I had very good friends in the industry who tried to talk me out of it and yeah. said, you know, why restrict yourself? Um, as I said earlier, I, I'm, I'm confident that I see these things coming down the line a little bit before other people, and I don't see anything coming down the line at the moment mm. to worry me. I think mm. WordPress is very comfortable where it is, yeah. and for all that we see, you know, great things spoken about Drupal eight, for example, um, that's a year away. Yeah, you know, um, and and we'll be at least three, if not four, WordPress releases further down the track by then, you know, so I'm happy that WordPress is the right technology to be on. Mm. And yeah, why wouldn't I shout about it? Mm. And it's funny too how you, how you were saying that some of your colleagues were saying, why restrict yourself? I don't see it as a restriction. I see that if you specialize in something, it actually frees you up to not worry exactly. about all the other noise, not worry about Expression Engine, not worry about Joomla, not worry about Drupal. We are specialists in WordPress. You know, Seth Godin famously says, bring me a brilliant specialist every time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I've always felt that, that you know, there, there are internal benefits as well to, to locking yourself down like that. Mm, um, absolutely. If, if you know that you're in something for the long haul, I think you put the extra effort in to get the fundamentals right. Yep. You don't just hack it together and get it out the door. If you yep. know that you can write something well today mm-hmm. and use it tomorrow and the next day and the next day, um, you know, that's a real benefit mm. to you. Mm. Um, and you know, it, 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 it simplifies the marketing message, yes. you know, it, people, people find you because you're a WordPress operator. Yeah. Um, it, it, it narrows the pool of, of, you know, potential contacts that you make in terms of, you know, freelancers or, you know, hiring people. It, it, I like being restricted. There's so many good quotes in the world about creativity coming from restriction. Yes, Absolutely. I think the last presentation I did, I, I quoted uh, the keyboard player from Deep Purple. Uh huh. He said very much the same thing. You know, great creativity comes from restriction, and I really buy into that. You know, I always felt that uh, PlayStation games were better than PC games because the hardware was restricted and locked down, and you yeah. didn't have to run on people upgrading their graphics chip. Or, yeah. You know, it's it's always made sense to me. Yeah. And I see it's the right place to be. And if you think about some, you know, think about some of the great art that's come out of independent theatre or fringe music, independent, unfunded you know, musicians, it's because they don't have the resources, they have to get creative and work with what they have, and so Precisely. it forces you to come up with creative ideas and creative ways of doing things. Agree more. So the Couldn't obvious agree. question that my audience are going to be asking now is, 
Um, what happens when a client says, well, uh, you know, how, how, how come your fees are so much because you're using WordPress and it's free and I can download it and do it myself? Now, I know that you guys are dealing with a different client base, i.e. Rolling Stones and Stephen Fry, which we'll talk about more in a moment. <laughs> but for the average freelancer who's dealing with a small business owner and is saying, yes, I'm a WordPress specialist, and the small business owner says, well, WordPress is free. How come you charge, how come you're trying to charge me five grand for a website? How do you overcome that kind of objection? I think you've got to have a good narrative to, to bring to the table at that point. I think you've got to say what you are bringing. You know, if you're a, if you're a handyman, you, know, you don't talk up the quality of your hammer. <laughs> you, know, you talk about what you can do with it, the experience oh. that you've got, the sites that you've built, the, the, the connections that you've made. Um, they, they aren't buying a solution. They aren't buying a tool. They are buying, they're buying outcomes at the end of the day. And you are the one who knows how to use that tool to get those outcomes. Um, for us, it's very rarely hard commercial outcomes. You know, we're not building e-commerce sites. We're not doing things that are easily trackable in terms of sales growth, for example. Um, we tend to be doing more, you know, resolving organizational problems. Um, and that's harder to measure. Not impossible to measure, but certainly harder to measure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, getting over that hurdle, I, I've got to say it's not a challenge I've ever really had to face much myself. So I can't give any great suggestions for it. Um, but, you know, I've always felt that if you're going in offering price and nothing but as yeah. you negotiate the position, you're going to lose because mm. someone will come in cheaper. Yep. And if that's your only defensive position, you haven't got a defensive position. Yeah. Um, we find that if we can say we know this territory, if you speak the language, if you know the organization's background, history, current challenges, if you speak the jargon, you know, if you make people feel like they're dealing with someone who's from their world, who knows what they're about. Um, that makes life an awful lot easier. I've got to say that once you get into a larger corporate context, actually WordPress often loses out because we come in too cheap. I keep hearing stories of people <laughs> winning bids that were, you know, they put in a price four or five times higher than we did. Mm. Because, and, and they got it because they were taken more seriously than we were. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and I'm always being encouraged by my team then to kind of, double or treble the figures we quote and so far yeah. resist. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly happens. Um, I, I like to think we, we put a fair price on what we bring to the table in terms of experience, expertise, and frankly, overheads and insurance. You know, we're, a, we're, a, 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 we're not a big team, but we're a larger team now. We need to do things like insurance, mm. backup, you know, all these kind of things that, that actually a, a client wants to feel is in place. And if they're only paying, you know, two, three hundred dollars for a piece of work, they're, mm. they're not going to have that. Yeah. You know, you're lucky, you're lucky you get anything for that price. Yeah. But with us, at least they know that we're here for the long term. We're building something. We have resources behind us and we're not going to disappear overnight. Are you, you guys are a distributed team. Is that right? We are. We're a team of six full-time now um, mm. with our eyes on number seven. Yep. And it, we're scattered across the UK. Mm -hmm. um, we've deliberately restricted ourselves to a very small geographic area mm -hmm. because, I, I mean, partly for legal reasons, but partly also just because I wanted to feel if we needed to get together, we could. Yeah. You know, in very short weeks, we can just literally, tomorrow morning, we're all getting together to sort this problem out and we can do that. Yeah. Whereas, you know, there are teams of similar size who are literally scattered to the four corners of the globe. Yeah. And that has benefits too. Yeah. You know, not, not either system is better than the other, but I know what we get from staying close. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think we get all the benefits of the flexibility, but we've also got the, the potential benefits of being close. Do you ever get any objections from clients saying, you know, uh, we're just not going to pay your fees because you're a bunch of freelancers that work from home. I mean, you don't even have an office. You don't even have like you know a building. What you know? Why are you, why are you charging what you're charging? Um, no, not that I've ever had. Um, I mean, people don't seem too hostile to it. I, again, because they're coming to us knowing that we are kind of WordPressy, open sourcey kind of people. Um, they're pre-filtered. If they're expecting a, an office block somewhere, 
um, with meeting rooms and people in suits, they probably wouldn't be speaking to us in the first place. Right. So how do you pre-filter them? Because that's a, that's a really interesting thing that you just said, that they're, they're, they're pre-filtered by the time they come to you. Is that because they've been reading your blog or that they've seen other work that you've done or that they already there's already an awareness about how you guys work before they arrive? Well, I mean, it's everything from the choice of our name, Don. I mean, we, we're making clear to people that we do things a certain way and we believe in doing it a certain way. And if if it scares people off, then that's fine because those yes. weren't people we were ever going to deal with. Yes, you know? yes, yes. Um, we, could, uh, we care about this open source stuff. We really genuinely do care about it. And we've got and we've got John Blackburn on our team who's got core commit rights to WordPress. We churn out a lot of plugins that we put into the official repo or we put it into GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen the bad things that happen in proprietary corporate mm. CMSs, I don't want a part of it. Mm. And I want to try and build something to counterbalance it. Um, and yeah, so, so people people know what they're getting. And, you know, equally, you know, the, the more meetups you speak at, the more videos you can you get your face on. Yeah. The, even the character of your tweets, for example. You yeah. Know? I mean, we don't blog very much on our company website, but we tweet a fair bit. Yeah. And it just all sets a tone. Mm. And if you know, if, if that's not what you're looking for, if you want the next IBM, well, look, we're not the next IBM. Mm. Nor do we want to so be. So, you know, one of the things that, one of the things that entrepreneurs, I was talking about this today, and it's, actually it's not just entrepreneurs, one of the things that all of us in business have, I was talking about this today in the workshop with a bunch of small business owners, is we have this inherent fear of missing out. So how do you reconcile and you just said it then if what you're doing scares off some people that's okay because they're not right for us how do you balance that with oh but there's business there that we might miss out on well i think it depends where you set your objectives isn't it? i mean what, what you want to be i mean do you do you measure your success in terms of size or quality or influence any of these things um, I look at some of the very large WordPress teams, you know, they're getting up into the 50, 100 mm. people territory. And, you know, I have a lot of respect for those guys, but they've gone at the last two or three years very differently to how we've gone at it. Um, we, we've been very, very selective about the, the work we do, but also the people we've hired. Um, we've never actually advertised for a position. We've always gone to people that we knew in the community and said, we like you. We like what you're about. We've seen your stuff. And of course, the beauty of it being open source is we can actually download and try your stuff. Mm. Um, we think you're a good fit for us. Can we talk to you? Mm. And that's how we've found our people. Um, so, yeah, I, I, we, we could have maybe scaled much faster, got to a kind of a 30, 40 level quite quickly if we'd wanted to. But I, I, I just... That, that's not what's going to make me happy. I, I used to run large teams. I find it quite difficult. Mm. Um, I, I, think, I think if I did it again, I'd do it better. But I just find it a real struggle. And it was, it was sapping. I didn't find it creative work. So even though I have stepped back from the front line now, I, I, I like to feel that you know, I've got my hands in the work. And, and we are producing good work that interests us. And, you know, the reality is, try to, you know, we get no shortage of, of people coming to us because we've established a good reputation. We've got our names listed in the right places. Yep. Um, we don't have to be quite so needy and desperate, you know, yeah. um, hungry. Yeah. That's a nice way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hungry. Because you can smell that stuff a mile away, can't you? I want to talk in a moment about Rolling Stones and Stephen Fry, but... You just mentioned before about you know going and speaking at meetups and making videos and using those videos to you know spread your message. What do you say to people who, for just for, for whatever reason, they're just too, they're paralysed by, you know, analysis paralysis, whatever it is, but they're paralysed by some kind of fear, and then they're not putting themselves out there. They're not producing videos. They're not producing a podcast. They're not blogging about their experiences. They're not having a public profile, what do, you, what do you say to freelancers who are in that position where they're just, for whatever reason, they're just scared to do it? I can understand it. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, I think we all get nervous. You know, I mean, there's, there's still an edge every time I stand up in front of a large group. Um, but I've found ways to deal with that. I prepare exhaustively. You know, I will spend the best part of two or three days rehearsing my script through and through and through so that I know I'm ready for it. Um, I think 
I think the confidence thing can be a hurdle. I think people feel I'm not that clever. Why am I standing up in front of all these people, you know, many of whom are smarter than I am, and trying to tell them that I'm some kind of expert? But the reality is, we all feel like that. And I think we should all accept that, you know, everyone, even the smartest guy in the room knows that somebody else is smarter than him on yes. something else. Yes. So we will all live with that concern of being exposed as the frauds that we probably all are. <laughs> and yeah, just, just, just go and deal with it. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I find, I find the, the, the challenge now exciting. I, I love being presented with something really difficult to talk about because it forces me to think mm. I don't go in expecting to have the perfect answer. Because you know, a lot of the time there isn't a perfect answer. And the beauty of this stuff is that it is so fast moving that there is no right answer. There is a high probability of being correct. Mm. But you know, I always see <laughs> every time you, know, you see Matt Mulberg or Andrew Nason doing a, 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 a talk or an interview or something, and they're always asked the question about what is the future of WordPress? They don't even know. Yeah, that's you know? Right. And if the figureheads of this movement can't answer that question, let's not get hung up about it nobody we are all making this up as we go along and we are all helping each other make it up as we go along together we know the answers mm. you're not you're not claiming any great supremacy over the rest of the world by being the guy who stands up and talks mm. chris lemmer talks about the imposter syndrome a lot and he admits that he experiences it richard branson has said this seth godden has said this and so you know i i i uh, applaud what you just said. Everyone feels like a fraud at some point, so just get over it and do it anyway. <laughs> okay. right. There was a quality threshold there. I mean, don't make a fool of yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes, that's right. Um, just before we talk about uh, the Rolling Stones and Stephen Fry, which I keep teasing about, uh, what's the what's the one thing, if you had a magic wand and you could fix one thing about your business, what would it be? That's interesting. Um, time. I hate to say it, but there are so many things that we would love to have the time to do. Yeah. And we've talked yeah. about carving out time within projects so that, you know, there's there's a maybe a feature or a plugin we want to build or, or, or push harder on. And we're going to go out looking for that project that gives us the opportunity to do that. And sometimes they come along, sometimes they don't. If you gave me a person's time for 12 months, I could pretty much list here and now what I would want them to go off and build. Mm. Um, I think we need to, we need to scale up a little larger, I think, to get that spare capacity. It's easier to find time like that when there are 10 of you, 20 of you, than when there's three or four. Mm. And that doesn't mean the ideas are any less valuable. The ideas are at least as strong, possibly stronger. Um, but yeah, you've just got to be practical. We cannot, if, if we're going to keep feeding everyone and their families, <laughs> we can't. We can't just say, right, you know what? You're going to take three months off from our team of three, yeah, and build this great thing that we all know we need and we all know you can do, and it's just a matter of time. Mm. But there isn't, there isn't that much time. So I think the one, the one weakness we have is that we, we're kind of betwixt in between in terms of size. I, I would. I would like to be a little bigger to find that potential. And yeah, it's, it's finding the right people at the right moment. You guys don't have product. You're, you're just a client services agency. Do you have any ambition to move into the product space at any point in the future? Only by accident. I, I, I didn't set the company up to be a product operation. And again, you know, we've had people who've kind of said to us, you know, you're fools for neglecting this. I, I don't really buy that. I look at a lot of the the kind of targeted companies that I respect and they've stayed true to their mission. You know, if, if we came up with something that was really valuable and people wanted to buy in terms of A, the product and B, the support, I wouldn't necessarily be averse to it. But I think the majority of what we've done in that space has ended up in open source code or conceivably contributed back to core. Mm. You know, so so it, it doesn't it doesn't really motivate me, it, which which is kind of because it, it would be something that I could own and love and really hone to perfection. I accept that, but I think what I enjoy about the client work is the variety. Deep yeah, down, I enjoy yeah. the fact that you know, in three months' time, you don't know what you'll be doing. 
but you will ha- you'll have learned from what you're doing today and it will be better yeah. in three months. And, and, you know, some people thrive on that, some people fear it. I thrive on it. Shane Pellman from Modern Tribe uh, is in Australia at the moment and, you know, they're a product, they're a client services agency and a product company and he said, that, he, he said the same thing. He said there's something about doing client work that he just loves. He loves the thrill of it. He loves the challenge. He loves the variety. And he said, I think I'd just be bored if we just did product. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, ultimately, you would you would build the base product and then version two, you would build it again. <laughs> it kind of makes me think, well, did you not get the first one right? Maybe you should have tried better in the first one. Um, support, you know, I, I don't like building things that require support and I think a product inevitably means support you know when we've done our best work we can hand it over to a client and they don't need to be told how to use it Mm. you know that's when I think we've really done our good work if it needs explaining we didn't try hard enough yeah they should they should just see it and get it and run with it wow and and I just can't believe a product could 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 have that Mm. you know um but you know others seem to make a pretty good go of it Mm. And, and I'm glad they're there. There's plenty of products out there that we rely on mm. and uh, happily fund. Mm. Do you, uh, when you talk about, um, you know, clients don't need to be explained how to use it, is that because you're heavily, heavily customising the WordPress admin or is that just because no. you've, no? No, it's, it's, we stay true to WordPress admin, actually. Um, if they can understand WordPress at all, they should be able to understand the, the stuff that we've grafted onto it. Gotcha. You know, the, the beauty of WordPress is that I mean, it's not quite so true now as it used to be, but you can point them at WordPress.com, yeah. get a free account at WordPress.com, have a play with that, and that's what your company website will look like. Gotcha. Um, you know, the customization that Automatic are doing at WordPress.com means that doesn't quite stand up as it used to. Mm. But, you know, it, it's those very same principles and concepts and, the, you know, you, you develop an instinct for where that button probably should be mm. and and it's up to us to kind of embrace that and, and stick with it. Mm. You know, all the more reason, I think, for us to be committed to core as a product, as a concept, you know. Um, when we build stuff, we always try to think, okay, is there anything that we could be feeding back into core on the back of this, um, is there a plugin that we can be giving out? Are we building this following the VIP guidelines? Mm-hmm. Um, even if the code has no prospect of going to VIP, mm-hmm. at least it keeps us on track and mm-hmm. makes sure that we stay true to to those kind of design and development principles. Let's talk about VIP for a moment. You guys are a WordPress VIP approved partner. Only one of two in Europe. The other one, of course, being Human Made, Tom yeah. Wilmot and Noel Tok, who have also been on the podcast. Um, I'm going to ask the question, how do you land clients like the Rolling Stones and Stephen Fry? I mean, <laughs> come on, man. I'm a huge... By the way, I'm a, I get a full disclaimer. I'm a massive fan of Stephen Fry. Huge fan of Stephen oh. Fry. Yeah, and yeah, I was... I, I, quite got to grips with that because I can't he seems so British to me I don't know how right. he translates overseas yeah well I just love I just love British humour I grew up watching the goodies and you know so oh. I, I just I just love British humour and I just love Stephen Fry and I'm you know a big fan of the Rolling Stones as well but how do you land fish like that how do you land clients like that well do you know it's funny in both of those cases it was a case of who we knew rather than what we knew yeah right to be perfectly honest yeah but you've got to then come forward with a compelling proposal that says okay we know who you are, we know what you're about, mm. uh, we know what you're going to want to achieve, and here's how we see ourselves delivering that. Mm. Um, the Stones being a, a, a good example, we we were brought in by their established designer mm-hmm. and were given the opportunity to come up with some development ideas, right? What would you do with this site, given the chance? Mm. And we just sort of scanned the horizon. What can we pull in here? We've got acres of you know photography and video content. We can hook into third-party APIs like, say, iTunes. So, for example, you go to the Stone site, you can find any album they've released. Uh, every track on every album has an audio preview. I don't know of any other major artist that can say that. Um, we've had a lot of organizational challenges with them because their back catalogue is so complex and obviously so vast. You know, I can't imagine a harder project for a band. You know? yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, why why has it been a fun one to work on? Because we we bought into it too. I mean, how could you not? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, personally, it's great for me because again, one of those first websites I remember seeing was the Rolling Stones. I saw it in about ninety, 
95, I think their first site went up. Um, and actually, there's a bit, I'm not going to tell you where it is, but there is a little Easter egg on the Stones site where we've recreated the original Stones homepage. Stop it. I'll tell you where, but you might find it if you dig into the source code. Um, and it, yeah, it was, it was, I mean, you know, if you get a project like that, of course you've got to push it hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, they've been, they've been fun to deal with. They've been difficult to deal with because it, scale is always massive, but actually the the decisions that get made are relatively small you know we're going to go off and do a show in melbourne for example isn't that big a decision for them to make mm. but you can imagine the wheels that that then sets yeah. in motion we've got to be standing by ready to to respond to that um so we've got work in progress at the moment to to rebuild the site it's been up now for two years getting on for three um, so it's high time we did something with it. So we're, we're rebuilding it to make it responsive, but also to make it managed by their people rather than us. Right. So we're putting everything we can into the WordPress customizer, everything from kind of background graphics to base color palettes, uh, typography. So if they announce at the drop of a hat, and it's happened before, <laughs> that there's a new tour or a new album or, you know, a new logo or, or, or how style, um, they can activate that themselves. So they're in full control of that. Wow. And we're very happy with that. We want to give them that kind of hands-on control. And that all comes back to, as I said, why I got into this whole WordPress space. I wanted websites that I could manage as, as an employee in a big organization. And ultimately, you know, as exciting as it must be to fill out 80,000 stadiums every other night, you're still an employee in a big organization. And I think, I think if you haven't seen the inside of big things like that, it's amazing how similar they all are. Yeah. I've, I've seen media companies, technology companies, governments, show business, and, and it's the same problems in the same way at the same times. You yeah. know, you might think it's more glamorous and maybe it is more glamorous and maybe the freebies you get are more exciting. But yeah, day to day, nine to five, you're doing the exact same things and you're facing the exact same problems. Mm. And, um, were you were you up against were you up against competition with the Rolling Stones? Did you have to pitch for it? Was it like did you did were you, were you was there anyone else in the running or was it just was it just kind of handed to you because of your reputation or because of your connections? I, I think it was it was mainly connections. I mean, we we find ourselves pitching a lot for stuff, and you know, I, you mentioned Human Made there. It's a really odd relationship that we have with them because we're best friends. Yeah. I mean, we'll be hanging out at the weekend, for yeah. example. Yeah. Um. But I know for a fact that every time we get a good pitch document, yeah, so did they, yeah, <laughs> you know, and and we have we have gone head to head on so many things. I know, um, we don't talk about it. There's kind of an understanding. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I I don't begrudge them that. I don't find it. I, I think unless you're in this space, you can you might find that a rather odd relationship. Mm. But actually, you know, there's there's so much interesting stuff happening in this space as it is. Yep. I don't feel that we're well, you know, we're not fighting over scraps. Yeah, no, that's right. It was good work going along. And, and by being in places like the VIP list, you know, it, it finds you. Mm. It's a big world and there's lots of people. Um, okay, quick elevation round, our lightning round of, of quick questions. For those that don't know, WP Elevation is a business accelerator program for WordPress freelancers and consultants. So I'm going to ask Simon a series of quick questions and hopefully he's going to be able to give us a series of quick answers that will be... Uh, Mind blowing and game changing. <laughs> no, no pressure, dude. <laughs> Thank you. Very uh, what's the number one thing any freelancer or consultant needs to know? A good accountant. <laughs> yes. I've lost track of how difficult these things have become. Um, the thousands that I was happily flushing down the drain without even realizing I was doing it. Wow. You know, you cannot understand tax law. And, and you know, company law and all these kind of things. Get someone else who can. That's great. We've I never. And this business, you know, we we're into self serve. You know, we we want to go off and find the information, do it ourselves. But you've no chance. Yeah. Can't do it. We've never had anyone recommend that, and I think it's a fantastic recommendation. Uh, what's the best thing you've ever done to find new customers? Talk about old customers. Talk about. Tell people customers. what you've done. Great. Um, blog about it. Tweet about it. Speak at events about it. No. Nice. Because. Clients generally are fairly conservative. They they want to feel that you know their territory. Mm. Um, they probably wouldn't hire you if you'd done their direct competitor, 
Mm. But if you've done the next one along in the chain, mm. they'll feel comfortable. So they will search for agencies who know about magazines. And there's one or two little things that are special about the magazine business, but not that much. Mm. You know? But if they see that you've done magazines, then you're one of us and you're yeah. an easy choice. How do you stop competing on price? Uh, compete on something else. <laughs> Look particularly at what you've got and, and decide how you can make a, 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 you know, a positive factor in how you present yourself. Yeah. Um, and actually it helps, I think, to, to have a nemesis, I think, to, to know who you are up against. So in our case, you know, we can look at Human Made, we mentioned, yeah. and I can say, well, okay, they work like this and we work like this. And that is a distinguishing point. Yeah. It, it, qualitatively, it may or may not matter, mm. but it's something else. Yeah. Tom, when I asked Tom Wilmot that question, how do you stop competing on price? He said, be deliberately more expensive than anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one answer, I yeah. suppose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, any tips on writing better proposals? Now, this might just be a personal bugbear of mine. Uh, formatting, punctuation, spelling, getting a capital P in WordPress. Um, I remember whenever I was hiring people, um, I don't do it so much now as I say we tend to cherry pick, but when you get a pile this thick of resumes, you're looking for reasons to discount them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, quite honestly, if somebody can't put the time and effort in to polish that, then how are they going to put the time and effort in to polish you yeah. for selling you to their client base? So spell check it, people. Yep. Read over it. Look yep. at it. I don't think it's... Well, if it's a personal bugbear of yours, it's one of mine as well because, it's you know, I've seen it happen so many times and it's one of the things that we talk about as well. Get your spelling and your grammar right because if you haven't got time to get it right the first time, how are you going to find time to fix it the second time? Exactly. Uh, favorite tool or system for CRM? We moved to Trello recently, uh -huh. which has been great for us. Um, everything else felt too structured, mm. and and we didn't necessarily want to adapt how we were working into their structure. Um, with Trello, uh, free of charge, which mm. doesn't do any harm, mm. um, we found it very very loose and flexible, and we could turn it into what we wanted. <laughs> Right. Um, so we have a kind of a, a boilerplate Trello board that we start with on, on most projects. Mm -hmm. And it's got, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 things that always come up. Everything from where's the hosting to who owns the DNS. Yep. And then we just fill in the specific tasks that need doing. And they move from a to-do list to a doing list to a done yeah. list, hopefully, in that order. Right. And... and yeah, people, we, people can log in and see that. The client can log in and see that. They can shuffle the cards around into an order if they want to dictate a priority. Mm -hmm. And everyone's got visibility. It's great. Wow. Nice. Uh, what's the best... I think you just answered this question. What's the best way to keep a project and a client on track? Well, it's partly Trello, but it's also... Um, we, we institute a weekly show-and-tell appointment every week. And... It's great because I think it gives a client a sense of reassurance. They know that they're always going to be seeing something new. But it also forces us to have something new, you know. So I'm quite happy it gives us discipline. Um, and, yeah, we just, just show the current work in progress, talk through the, the Trello position, and see you again next week. I like that this is scheduled. I like that this is a scheduled part of the project because it m means that you don't leave the client hanging wondering what you've been doing. Exactly. Yeah. Because then, you know, then you've got to find, you know, when's a good slot and maybe I'm too busy today, I'll do it next week. No, I, I like the discipline. Mm. Um, and, and, it, and, you know, it comes back to what we said earlier on about forcing yourself into restriction. Mm. If you know you've got to have it ready for four o'clock on a Wednesday, mm. then you will have it ready for four o'clock <laughs> on a Wednesday. And you won't forget it because it's always four o'clock. That's right. It's like turning up to the book club, not having read the book, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so career <laughs> any ideas for getting referrals from existing clients um it's not really one that we face often because it's not you know the people we deal with tend to spend all their time in their organization yeah. you know, for better or worse um i think all i can say and i know it's something that other people you've had on here have said just keep doing good work yep. you know we're, we're selective about what we even take on if we don't feel we can make a real difference on a project we'll probably pass on the opportunity yep um, 
So, so we go in knowing that we want to do a good job. Hopefully that we then do a good job. And yeah, we make sure that the news travels fast. And if the existing customer doesn't tell the next customer, then it's our job to make sure that they find out some other way. Mm. What's the number one thing you can do to differentiate yourself? Yeah, well, I, mean, I think we kind of touched on this. I think it's, I think it's spin doctoring in its purest sense. I think mm. you've got to look critically at yourself you got to look critically at the other guy. And, and you know, if you've got to go out and find a nemesis, even artificially, mm. I think that's a good thing. I think mm. you can define yourself by what you're not just as much as by what you are. And pick out those distinguishing elements and try and find a way that you can then turn it, turn it into a positive reason to choose you. Mm. Now, as I say, it may not be any better or worse than the other guy. Mm. But, I mean, you know, we talked about human-made. Human-made are a similar size to us, but they're much more geographically scattered. They've mm. got head office in the UK, but they've got people in mm. Australia, mm. South America, um, where else? US? Mm -hmm. Norway? Um, which is great, and that's a real benefit. So they can go out with their head held high and say they're a global operation. Mm. That's tremendous. Um, we don't have that. We have consolidated and kept it very, very close. So my story on that is that we are close, we are available, we're working your office hours, we all know your culture, your legal framework, we just get you mm -hmm. in a way that maybe the guy in Australia or in South America just doesn't. Mm -hmm. And people can then choose. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we're better or they're better for being local or global, but you get what you want. If you want somebody global, great. If you want someone local, Great. Sure. So we spoke about this at the start of the interview, about this narrative that, and it sounds like this is a, a, a recurring theme, is that, and it reminds me the first time I went to, the first Pressnomics I went to, and I saw Corey from iThemes, I think he was the first cab off the rank, and his presentation was all about, tell your story and let everyone else tell their story. But don't worry yeah. about them, they're just noise. Just tell your story. And it sounds like this is a a thing that you've consciously been working at over the years is to work out what your narrative is and work out what your story is to tell. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. I, I, think, I think you need it for yourself, first and foremost. I think you need to remind yourself why you're coming in every morning mm. and what you're trying to achieve. What is the end goal going to look like? And, and if it's a, you know, three Ferraris parked outside, that's great. Give you something to aim for. Mm. Um, for us, I mean, our motivation, as you know, we've even hinted at by choosing quite a, a provocative name for the company, you know, we really care about democratization of technology. Mm. And, and, you know, I can trace a line through my career and into Code for the People and then out of it as well of, of how we are trying to deliver on that objective. Mm. And, and, you know, it, it, it forces us to do certain things a certain way. It means that if we have an opportunity to open source something or contribute something into WordPress core, then we'll do that, you know, because that's what we are about. Mm. And yeah, I, I think it's almost more important for us internally. You know, I think if you decide what your values are, decisions get made very easily. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't agree with you this more. Is, uh, therefore, the right thing to do is this. Yep. And, and you need to think about it. You know? yeah. and, and some large organizations when I was, you know, doing full-time employment, I remember going through kind of, you know, corporate branding exercises where you would nail down sort of three core values. And, you know, a lot of the time it, it could be very vague stuff like, oh, I don't know, quality and responsibility. All that kind of thing. But, no, down the things that are really unique and special to what you're about. Yeah. And actually, you know, you've got three, that those are your three judges sitting in court. So when you've got a problem, put it in front of them mm. and they will have the answer. I really like it. Uh, it reminds me of a book by Stephen Sinek, Start with why? I think he's no Simon Sinek. His name is Simon Sinek. Start with why? Um, I'm going to put that in the show notes under the video. But check out startwithwhy.com. It's a it's a fantastic philosophy on defining your why. Why is it that we're here? Why do we turn up every morning and do this? Uh, nice little segue into our competition. <clears throat> so I'm going to give away a free coaching call on Skype with my good self. You can ask me anything you like about your WordPress business, and I'll do my best to help you to enter this competition. Simon Simon and I were talking uh, pre-interview. What we'd like you to do is leave a comment under this video and tell us when you have taken 
either a weakness that you have and spun that into a positive, in other words, reframed your narrative from a weakness into a positive, or taken an objection, a negative from a client and reframed that narrative and spun that into a positive. Leave the comment, I know it's a bit creative and you're gonna to have to think about this one, but that's why you get prizes for putting in the work. So leave a comment under the video and I'll get Simon to come by in a couple of weeks and award a prize. That sound good, Simon? I would be glad to. I've, I've always felt that there's there's been a real downer on the word spin over the last sort of 10 or 15 years. I think it's a perfectly valid thing to consider. And in fact, one of my great heroes was a was a, a guy called Alistair Campbell, who was Tony Blair's spin doctor. I, I've seen him up close. I've seen him work. I, he's he's a phenomenal operator. He's really inspired me in so many ways without, you know, without even touching technology particularly. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I really believe that unless you get a grip of that narrative, mm. someone else will get a grip of it. Mm. And it's up to you to decide how to, how to make it work for you. Yeah. You know what? I think that's why I fell in love with WordPress when I first started using it because I've always been a big advocate for what I think of as a positive communication. So it's a, mm. you know, it's a way of communicating positively to your audience and it's a way of communicating in a positive way. And WordPress for me there was just allowed me to put that on steroids really quickly, <laughs> really quickly with a kind of a, a pretty short learning curve. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's what drew me to the, the internet in the first place. I mean, this was, this was a place that you could put your view of the truth yes. out there. Yep. And I was doing it on, on behalf of, of a national government talking about wars in Yugoslavia as well as thing. You know, this was, this was big stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I remember we would watch, you know, propaganda broadcasts from the other side, if you like. And actually, this felt like a real contribution to democracy, mm. to put the facts out there. And, well, our view of the facts, but if everyone's putting their view of the facts on the same table, mm. then you as an individual can look at it and make your own decision. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, when I hear people like Matt Mullenweg or even Jake Goldman talking about democratization in the WordPress context, that's absolutely what I signed up for. Mm. And I cannot see a tool that's in a better position mm to deliver on that vision. It's grand, it's crazy ambitious, but yeah. we're making it happen. Yeah. What's the future for Code for the People? Where do you think you guys will be in 12 months' time? Do you know, that's an interesting one. I, I've, I've stopped caring too much <laughs> because, you know, as long as I can see what's coming down the track, I know whether I've got to jump out of the way or not. Um, I, I think we're seeing a trend towards larger operators in our space uh, you know you see stories every other week about um you know agencies uniting or being bought out theme operators jumping into somebody else's bed you know all this kind of thing i, I think wordpress as an industry is growing up it's getting bigger mm. um i, I w we'll be bigger in some way in 12 months time but what kind of bigger i just don't know mm. I'm, I'm open to all possibilities on that but i think as I said earlier, I think I can see things I wish we were able to do and we just can't because we've got too much to actually get done day to day. I would love to to reach that scale somehow and it might be organic or it might be one great leap to to get access to that spare capacity mm. and, and do some of the things that we really feel need to be done, either for ourselves or for the core product. Well, you know, I hear crowd favourite are uh, buying up uh, everything in their path, so... <laughs> has been noted <laughs> but do you know what i guarantee they won't be the only one yeah because i think i think they've they've lit the fuse on quite a lot of things i, I get the sense that there will be more to come mm. in the near future I, it, it just makes perfect sense i think alex king's told a great story about why he sold out and it was you know to, to leapfrog those growing pains yeah. you know they knew they needed to get big to do corporate -y kind of things and have salespeople and project managers and account managers and this kind of thing. And you can either grow that organically and fingers crossed you get it right, but you may not. Yeah. Or you can find somebody who's got there already yep. and can, can you know, pull you up towards that level. It's, and that's, look, it's, a, it's, a compelling, it's a compelling offer, isn't it? I mean, I think one of the mm -hmm. biggest frustrations I have on a daily basis is the fact that I feel like we don't have the resources to do the stuff that we want to do. Correct. You know, it's, it's a very compelling... It's very compelling. I mean, I've, I think about it all the time. I think, what would it mean if someone came along and said, hey, here's some more resources and, you know, it, it's, it's exciting and scary and it's going to be interesting to see how this whole ecosystem plays out over the next 12 months. Um, 
Man, this has been epic. I've, I could sit here and do this for hours, um, but I'm conscious of everyone's time. Where can people reach out and thank you for this interview, Simon? Um, well, you can find us on Twitter uh, at CFTP. And, and actually, you know what, actually, while I'm here, can I thank the Canadian Family Taekwondo Programme for being so very good at releasing their Twitter account that they weren't using? Oh. This is the first chance I've had to thank them publicly. So Maybe. thank you, CFTP, for handing over your Twitter account to us. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Just because we ask nicely. Wow. Um, so you'll find us at thereacodefortheople.com. I'm Simon D on Twitter. And yeah, please, let's talk. Wow, awesome. The Canadian Family Taekwondo Program. Yeah. Wow. I, I've, I've learned anybody that's into martial arts, you'd be polite to. Right. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with us on the WP Elevation Podcast. I really appreciate Genuine it. And pleasure. wish you all the best for Code for the People. Uh, final question. Who would you like me to interview and why? This was a hard one, but I'm going to nominate a guy called Kasper Hubinger. Kasper is operating in Germany, and I think that one of the most exciting territories for WordPress in the next 12 months is going to be internationally. Mm. I, think, I think the German ecosystem is, is very self-contained and mm. very interesting for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and because they're operating in a non-English language environment they push the boundaries quite hard in things like multilingual content. So I think the perspective you would get from somebody like Casper will be very, very different. And you know what? It's great to just reach out behind what we know yeah, and see how these guys are doing. Awesome. Okay, Casper. Well, courtesy of Simon Dixon from Code for the People, I'm coming to get you. So keep your eyes on your inbox. Hey, man, thank you once again for spending some time with us. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Fantastic. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Simon. Well, I hope you enjoyed meeting Simon Dixon as much as I did. Uh, Of course, this episode is brought to you by Video User Manuals, the first original and the best video tutorial plugin that puts over 60 video tutorials in your client's WordPress dashboard to teach them how to use WordPress, WooCommerce, and SEO by Yoast. You can learn more about the plugin and find out how you can use it as part of your pre-sales process to differentiate yourself and start getting more clients at wpelevation.com slash vum. Of course, subscribe to the podcast so that you never miss an episode and uh, also a chance to win these amazing prizes that we give away every week. Uh, You can subscribe at wpelevation.com slash subscribe. Uh, Everything you need to know about this episode will be in the show notes at wpelevation.com slash Simon Dixon. That's all one word, no space, no hyphen, S-I-M-O-N-D-I-C-K-S-O-N, Simon Dixon. Uh, And remember to leave your comments underneath the video uh, to enter the competition to win a free coaching call with myself. Remember the question is, how have you spun one of your weaknesses or a client objection or negative into a positive Simon is all about um, reclaiming the word spin as not a dirty word. Uh, So how have you spun a negative or one of your weaknesses into a positive? Next week's guest, we've got a very, very special episode happening next week. Uh, I am actually swapping seats with Matt Medeiros from The Matt Report. So Matt is going to host an episode of the WP Elevation podcast, and he's going to be interviewing Jason Cohen from WP Engine. And I am going to be hosting an episode of the Matt Report, and I'll be interviewing Nathan Barry from Authority. So I'm very excited about it. I hope you are too. Please get on over to iTunes and leave us a five-star review if you think we are uh, worthy of it. Uh, Until next time, go Elevate.